Wow. So this is uh, th this is fun. I I resolved, given given that I was getting this, that I should uh, sit down and, and read Joyce um, finally, which I didn't actually do. So oh well. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, uh, uh, I don't think I'm here for my literary. Uh, skills. I, I think it's one of those sort of backhanded, you don't write too badly for an economist thing. So, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, I could, uh, I could talk about lots of things. Actually, I'd actually really rather talk about the Friday Night Music. Those are, uh, <laughs> those, those are those, that's part of the, the whole job that I enjoy most. But I will, I guess I have to talk about some economics. And particularly, I'm glad to uh, be visiting Ireland, which is, as we all know, a a uh, shining example of success and economic recovery. It must be true. Everybody in the European Commission is saying so. Um, <laughs> those same people were saying the same thing back in 2011, and then actually they were saying the same thing back in the uh, winter of 2009-10, but maybe this time it's for real, anyway. Uh, so, uh, actually, I, I'm going to try and talk uh, about, obviously, the, it's. I, I can talk about things other than the ongoing economic crisis, but it is kind of hard, and uh, so I'm, I'm going to, to, to do that. But I'm going to give you a, a personal spin on it, and I want to tell you that these have been a very, really, these, we're, we're now six years into this, right? If, you, uh, if you're, it, Ireland, it's actually almost seven, but in any case, we're, we've been in an ongoing economic crisis, and it's been very revealing in a lot of ways. Uh, it's obviously the, the main stories, the important stories all involve the people who have been affected by it. Uh, and I'm going to be, it's going to sound a little self-centered, but it, it actually isn't, I hope, in the end. But I'll give you a self-centered take. I've learned two things from these years and years. Uh, the first one is that I am not a phony, um, and, uh, or actually that, that economists actually do know something useful um, when, when they allow themselves to know it. That, that in fact, we, we actually have something useful to say. Or, I'm sorry, we have something informative to say. Because the second part is that I and my profession in general have turned out to be virtually useless in practice. And I'm going to talk about, uh, if that sounds kind of weird, it's meant to. Uh, but I'll, I'll explain uh, what, what I mean by all of that. So, let me talk about first of all, about, about things that happened long before this crisis. Uh, once upon a time, uh, we had a revolution, in, a, a revolution of thought. It was uh, now 80 years ago, almost 80 years ago. Um, there, was, th there are several things in economics that were deeply mysterious 80 years ago. Some of them are still mysterious now. So if you ask, what is, I think, at this point, the biggest mystery it is how it can be that some countries are so much poorer than others. There is that if, if there were some one thing that, that we still really don't understand, we, we work on it, we do uh, hopefully good stuff, but we really don't understand it, is how it can be that with everybody having access to the same technology that we can have such large dis disparities in the world. That's an unresolved mystery. It used to be that there was another mystery that was just as deep, which was how it is that you can have these things called recessions. I think people actually, familiarity, especially these past six years or so of, of, of horror, have bred a kind of feeling that this is a normal thing, that it's a kind of an expectable thing, but it really isn't. You know, think about, okay, Ireland being a small country, it's a little easier to understand how things can go so badly here, but think about Europe as a whole. Think about, uh, or, the, or the United States as a whole, but Europe is doing worse, so it's even more striking. Um, here you have uh, a bunch of countries that are, well, there, there, there are more, demography is a longer term problem, but there are more working age people in Europe than there were in 2007. There are, there's more capital, there's uh, some, not as much investment as you'd like, but still there's more, there, there are more factories and more uh, office buildings, the productive capital is bigger. Um, the uh, technology has advanced. One of the interesting things about this economic crisis is that it happens to have coincided with at least with some quite visible technological progress. The, the iPhone was introduced in 2007. The whole mobile internet, iPhones, tablets, all of that is, is stuff that has happened since the world went to hell. 
It's, uh, so, so we, you know, we have not, our, our workforce hasn't, been, hasn't died in a series of plagues. Uh, termites haven't eaten the capital stock. Technology, we haven't forgotten anything technologically. We're more advanced than we were. And yet, of course, we're poorer for the most part than we were. Uh, per capita GDP in the Eurozone is about 4.5% lower than it was in 2007. Uh, how can that happen? Uh, and by the way, just for com historical comparison, in, um, if you go back to the Great Depression, Western Europe uh, had surpassed its 1929 level of per capita GDP by 1936. So unless there's going to be an enormous boom uh, in the next year in Europe, then, then Europe is at this point doing worse than it did during the Great Depression. The first two years weren't as bad, but the recovery that took place in the 30s has not been happening this time around. So that's, that's also quite impressive. Um, it used to be that this was a, how, th how can this happen? How can economies go backwards? How, how, can, how can we become poorer when, when all the things that should make us richer are continuing to operate? We have more workers, we have more capital, we have, we have better technology. That was a complete, well, I wouldn't say it was, people wrote about it. But it's, uh, those of you, there must be some economists in this room, or economic students, right? Try, try reading pre-Keynesian <coughs> business cycle theory. Um, it's quite an experience. It's like, basically like burying your head in a bowl of oatmeal or something. It's, uh, it's, it's essentially incomprehensible. People used a lot of fancy words, but they had no idea. Uh, but we worked it out. And of course, it wasn't just John Maynard Keynes. It was a bunch of, of people, but came up with a, a story that seemed to fit the facts. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't an obvious story at all. I mean, if, if, to this day, basic <coughs> macroeconomics is deeply counterintuitive to lots of people. Uh, if you say, uh, uh, you know, how, is, how is it possible that there can be an overall lack of demand? People have to spend their money on something, don't they? And, well, it takes some, some hard thinking to, to realize that that's not true, that it's really, it is possible for people collectively to, to not want to spend enough to keep the economy fully employed. The notion that printing money can actually help as opposed to lead to inflation, that's something that a lot of people find hard. Uh, there's a very strong notion that, uh, well, actually, take, to take a good example, uh, unfortunately from my side of the Atlantic, but it, it'll, it'll it, certainly, we're not lacking in, in people who don't understand stuff. Uh, we're, we're, uh, when back in, in early 2009, as the U.S. was in the worst of it, rather famously, the, the Republican leader in the House of Representatives, now the Speaker of the House, uh, said, uh, well, people are having to tighten their belts, so the government should tighten its belt, too. And that's a very natural reaction. Hard times, we should have government austerity, because it, it needs to share in the hardship. Um, the, lots of people looking at what was done in 2009, whatever, uh, looking at, at all of the increase in the money in, in the monetary base in the United States, looking at the government budget deficit, said, well, you know, look at all that money we're printing. Look at all the amount that we're borrowing. Inflation, interest rates are going to take off. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer. So this, this view that we arrived at about how, um, about how, uh, uh, it, how in fact it's possible to have a recession, uh, how it's possible for economies to move backwards, maybe for extended periods of time, uh, it was, was really something that was, was a major breakthrough, if, if you think it's right. So we, it, and I, I've, I've been using various metaphors, a little bit, I, the thing for some reason that comes closest to my mind to is, is plate tectonics in geology. Uh, you know, in the 60s, if you follow, read these things, they, pe people knew, obviously, they understood erosion. They understood how mountain ranges get torn down, but they really had no idea what pushed them up. If you go, if you look at an old geology textbook, it'll say, when you ask, what, what lifts mountain ranges? And they'd say, well, earth forces, which was just a fancy way of saying, we haven't the faintest idea. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then came along this, this thing, which of, of you know, we did, they discovered seafloor spreading, they realized they, and, they, and all of a sudden it made sense. Now, it turns out that it's, it's not as if you know, geologists can't predict the timing of earthquakes. They can't predict uh, the time of volcanic eruptions. Uh, so it, it, uh, you know, economists can't predict uh, the timing of financial crises very well. Uh, but nonetheless, it was clear that all of a sudden they had a, a model that made sense of it and that made a lot of successful predictions in the sense of explaining what kinds of features you would see in the world. Um, 
So that was a huge intellectual revolution. Uh, in terms of what I was saying, now it's a personalizing it. So if, if you're an economist, if you're actually I think if you're any kind of social scientist, um, unless you're very unself-reflective, you have to be experiencing a lot of doubt all the time, a lot of self-doubt. Because after all, how do you know that you actually, in fact, know anything? I mean, certainly you know facts, and you've, you've mastered the literature, and, and you presumably know how to game the academic system, you know, how to, how to write papers in a way that will get past the referees and, and, and get cited. Uh, but do you actually, you know, do you know anything about the real world? You don't get to do experiments. You don't get to look at lines on a spectrograph and say, oh, that's true. Or, you, know, you don't get to observe the, the, the sun's uh, um, apparent position relative to Mercury and say, look, light bends. You, don't, you don't get very few of those opportunities. Uh, and there is, I, at least certainly for me, I, I spent the first, uh, whatever it would be, I guess at this point, 55 years of uh, my life. Well, I guess I wasn't a professional economist. And, uh, so I spent about 30 years <laughs> thinking I knew what I was doing, <laughs> hoping I knew what I was doing, but without a whole lot of confirmation. Uh, along comes this monstrous economic crisis. And if you take the model seriously, you had some predictions that were very, very much at odds with um, what people who didn't know that stuff said. So you were saying, I was saying, and I was certainly not alone, um, well, you know, things change when you are in a depressed economy. You can print lots of money, it's just gonna sit there, it's not gonna be inflationary. Um, you can have large government deficits, they're only um, borrowing money that has no place else to go, and so interest rates are not gonna go up. Uh, what you're gonna find out, actually really uh, think that thing that people found really uh, hard to accept was the notion that under conditions like these, the government is actually not competing with the private sector for resources. That if the government cuts spending, that won't free up money and labor to be used by the private sector. It'll actually just shrink the economy and in fact, private, private uh, consumption will go down. Private consumption plus investment will go down, not up, if governments try to cut back. And uh, thoughtfully and helpfully, uh, the Troika provided us with a bunch of, of experiments by imposing drastic cuts in government spending. Uh, and they all came true. All of this stuff turned out to be true. All of this stuff that a lot of people found just deeply implausible, even, even ridiculous, uh, uh, came true. The absence of inflation despite huge increases in, in, in the monetary base and in, the, in outside money, the money that's created by the Fed or by the ECB. Um, the, um, uh, failure of interest rates, actually record low interest rates despite record high deficits. Um, and of course, the, uh, um, if, if you look, actually if you look at my blog from I think yesterday, you'll see that uh, if you just plot changes in government spending against changes in private spending uh, within, uh, within Europe these last few years, the correlation is positive, not negative, which is, which is what, uh, what, we, uh, so what I would say. Uh, but very much not at all what a lot of people were saying a few years ago. Um, as I say, it's really, it's really, this stuff is not at all what people coming, who, who, don't, who don't understand this stuff think. It's, it's uh, take the example, I think, deep, deep motivating example, or a, a teachable moment. Our president has said, used that phrase too many times, but anyway, I, I, it is a good phrase. Teachable moment is unemployment benefits. Um, if you're somebody like me, you say that actually paying benefits to the unemployed, special extended benefits because it's so hard for them to get jobs, actually creates jobs because it puts money in the hands of people who will spend it and expands the economy. A lot of people, not all of them idiots, find that just absurd. You think you create jobs by paying people not to work? That's, that's ridiculous. So this is a very counterintuitive framework, but it has worked. And so, in some sense, my, my soul is at peace because it turns out I, wasn't, I haven't been faking it all these years. Uh, it turns out that the, the analysis actually works, the models actually work. They actually give you an understanding of the world that people who haven't studied this stuff uh, don't, don't, apparently don't have. Um, okay. Nonetheless, um, I'm useless. Socially useless. Do no, absolutely no good to the world. And the reason is that this knowledge only does the world some good if people in positions of actual power and authority make use of it. And the amazing thing about these past 
um, six, seven years, is that confronted with a crisis that we understand, not, not that people could predict the timing, right, but that we understand basically what's going on here and we understand what to do about it, the overwhelming reaction of authority, of politicians, but also of, of people <coughs> who aren't necessarily beholden to the voters but think they're doing the right responsible thing has been to ignore all of that and to make up reasons to do exactly the wrong thing. Uh, so I mentioned Speaker of the House, actually the future Speaker of the House at that point, but anyway, uh, John Boehner, uh, doing this remark about how well people have to tighten their belts and, um, be and so the government should tighten its belt as well. And so, you know, a lot of us actually, there were many commentaries from economists and boy is that stupid, really that's stupid. Um, that was, I think, in February, January, February 2009. By about September of 2009, that line, the government has, you know, people are having to tighten their belts, the government should tighten its belt too, was showing up consistently in the speeches of a guy named uh, Barack Obama, President of the United States. Because it was obviously a line that was so appealing that his speechwriters felt that he should use it whenever possible. That really resonated with the public. And, um, somebody, uh, I, I, I gather that his inner economic advisors were trying to get it out, uh, but they couldn't. Kept on, it kept on coming on back. Um, the widespread view, there, there was a widespread view that, um, among, again, among people with actual influence, that never mind all this stuff about how the government can actually increase demand by spending more, uh, we know that what the government needs to do is to promote confidence. And the way you can do that is by spending less. And so even in this depressed economy, you need to cut back. Uh, and there will be no adverse consequences because increased confidence will, will actually be expansionary, never mind this, this economic type logic. Uh, the, I think my contribution to economic language in the end will largely come out of that because I have coined a phrase which has caught on, which is, that's believing in the confidence fairy. Um, the, uh, the, <coughs> actually, if you want to say where, where did this really catch on, where, where did people start using this doctrine, this, this view first, it would be, of course, with respect to this place. It was, um, if you go back to, oh, go back to the spring of 2010, you'll find quite a few People actually you'll find, in particular, Jean-Claude Trichet, the then uh, president of the European Central Bank, um, confidently, first of all, saying we have a model for Greece. That model is Ireland. That's the famous statement, and uh, and proclaiming that that the, all of this austerity would be would it would not have an adverse effect on economies that they would expand, not contract. Um, actually, again, uh, Trichet, um, you might know he's a perfectly nice guy, uh, saying saying that the it was incorrect to suggest that there would be any, any adverse effect. Um, and citing Ireland as the prime example, based actually not on what was actually happening in Ireland, but what they imagined would happen. It's kind of an interesting form of, of evidence by you, you project what you think is going to happen and then use the projection as evidence, even though it didn't actually happen. Well, um, and, so, and that, by the way, this is interesting because it's not just, so we're not just talking about politicians, and we're not talking about people who are ill-educated, uninformed. We're talking about people, well, uh, central bankers, and I'm sorry to say quite a few economists. Because the interesting thing is economics developed this understanding <coughs> of, of how it is that recessions happen and what you can do about them. Uh, but a lot of economists rejected it. And they rejected it for a couple of intersecting reasons. If I were, actually, if I were a literary theorist, I guess I'd say it's overdetermined, uh, right? Or, so if I actually had, was the kind of person who had actually read James Joyce, I would say, I would start to use phrases like that. But it's partly <laughs> politics, because unfortunately the notion that the government can do something useful in a positive direction during an economic slump is, in many people's minds, inseparable from the notion that the government can do positive things generally. And so it becomes a left-right thing, even though it really shouldn't. It really should be something you can divorce from that larger question. Um, and also a very economics thing. It is very hard, Keynesian economics or anything that looks like Keynesian economics is hard to uh, reconcile with the notion that 
markets work perfectly and individuals are perfectly rational. Uh, now my point of view, and, and that of, I guess we could say you know, half the profession, is that, well, if, if you have very clear facts about how the world works and they are inconsistent with perfect rationality, so much the worse for perfect rationality. And we should try to understand exactly where this comes from, but if it's a fact, it's a fact. That's not, unfortunately, the other half of the profession doesn't see it that way. And, uh, and it's actually a lot, it's actually quite hard to publish papers in the journals that just say, hey, you know, don't exactly know how to model this, but this is, this is how things actually work. So it, that's become an issue <coughs> of surprising importance. I think not so much because anybody really believes the perfect rationality models as because it creates a cacophony of voices. It means that instead of speaking with one voice about what's going on here and what we should do, the economics profession has basically provided a menu. A political figure or a, some, someone in, at the European Commission can always find somebody, uh, it, with, with somebody with a PhD and, and a long publication record uh, to tell them whatever it is they want to hear. And that has not been good either. Um, the result is kind of where I started. Amazingly, although we, see, in 1933, people had no idea what was happening to them. They did not have a framework. They didn't know, there, there was no way to make sense. And there were a few people, actually. Keynes uh, was writing very clearly Keynesian analyses of the Great Depression quite a few years before he actually got around to writing the book that, that pulled the whole thing together. And, and there were a few, quite a few other people as well. Sorry, just random thought hit me. It turns out there were a couple of American authors who had written what amounted to a Keynesian analysis, explaining what the government could and should do. And there's a copy of their book in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's library from before he became president. And you can, in his handwriting, there's his own notation on what he thought of the book. He wrote, too easy. <laughs> so that, that in a way tells you just how, how hard it is for people to to believe in these things. But anyway, um, this time we don't really have that excuse. We, we have three generations of, of theory, three generations of analysis, and we have history. We have one of the great things we sh that should have given us an advantage over our grandparents is that um, uh, this time we know that the Great Depression happened. We know quite a lot about how it happened, and that should have enabled us to manage things better. What turned out is that in the, in the heat of the crisis, in the crazy period, there, there was a stretch roughly from, uh, from, from September 2008 when Lehman fell until sometime around May of 2009, which I've tried to, there isn't a well-known, there isn't a standard phrase for this. I've been trying to popularize the phrase that's the, oh God, we're all going to die period, when there was panic <laughs> in, in the markets. And, and everybody understood that that needed to be contained. So that was good. And actually, in subsequent occasions, in, when there was a panic in the euro area in, in late 2011, and, and then again in the summer of 2012, th those were contained. But, but the larger policy has been no better, and in a fair number of cases, worse than it was in the 1930s. And as I said, at this point, Europe is behind its performance in the 1930s, which is really quite awesome if you think about it. Uh, how can all this be happening? So, oh, so, so bottom line, that, all that, of course, is that people like me actually really do know something, and it does absolutely no good, uh, because the people in power w won't listen. And so there we go. All right. Hopefully, I guess I, I like to think that, that, that we get a little bit more out of it, but uh, it has been humbling to realize that you can make your argument, and you can be right, well, I haven't been right about everything, but certainly relative to those guys, I've been right about everything, and it still doesn't matter. You're still regarded as, as unsound for, for advocating uh, a different policies. Um, there's a whole thing one could talk about at, at, much, at great length, which is to try to understand, you know, why, did, why, why does this happen? Why don't we, uh, why, why, why do good ideas fail to prosper? Why do, public figures stick with ideas and policies that manifestly don't work. A um, few things, and I'm not going to do the whole thing because I'm actually going to wind this up in a couple of minutes, but the um, uh, part of it is just the force of conventionality. And I would say 
it, so there, there are actually differences, right? This is, many things have been the same um, but, uh, across, across the Atlantic. It's actually quite amazing how similar in many ways the crisis has been. We did many things differently. Uh, you know, the United States financed its housing bubble by having uh, complicated financial instruments that nobody understood. By and large, the European housing bubbles were financed quite straightforwardly through the wholesale market, but the end result was pretty much the same disaster. Um, you know, many things were different, but the end result was quite, a lot, quite similar. The U.S. has the advantage of being a country with actual actual budget and 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 all of the and, and actual you know a, a level of banking union and political union that Europe can only dream of. Uh, the United States has the disadvantage of having one of its two major political parties being, to use the technical phrase, uh, batshit crazy. Um, the, uh, uh, in the European context, what is really interesting, much more so than the United States, is the extent to which really, really bad ideas are promoted and implemented by seemingly reasonable people. And I uh, can speculate on that quite a lot. I'm actually rather partial to the view that <laughs> this has a lot to do with, um, uh, with the revolving door in, in politics, with, with the fact that people will not be in office indefinitely. And I, don't, I doubt that there's conscious corruption here. I, I, that happens, obviously, but mo mostly, actually, my home state of New Jersey, that happens a lot, but that's not what's going on at, at the European <laughs> level. Instead, it's a, to some, at some level, if you're, you know, if, you're, if you're a finance official in a European country, uh, particularly a small European country, wh what's your future afterwards? It's not actually, you're not going to be in, in politics or in government uh, five years, ten years from now. Um, you're going to prosper personally by being on corporate boards, by giving... Uh, well-regarded talks at Davos, uh, and so Keynes had a dictum uh, saying that, uh, it's actually, I've got the quote written down here, worldly wisdom teaches that it is better for reputation to fail conventionally uh, than to succeed unconventionally. Um, that has got to be a factor here. If you think about it, if you are a, a, someone who has dutifully pushed, continued uh, austerity policies, honoring debts, all the things that have happened here. Um, compare that with somebody who oh, urged Ireland to do an Iceland, uh, or, even, uh, or even somebody who actually was in Iceland. Who do you think is going to be on the, the board of, of, uh, of Citigroup? Who do you think is going to be uh, you know, getting good press at Davos? I think you can think about that and think about how that affects the motivations of, of people. Speculation, I don't know that. And, and as I said, I think there's very little raw corruption in all of this, but I think there is a, a, an influence thing. So anyway, uh, that's, that's the story. It's been, it's been a quite amazing time. Um, and uh, 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 as I said, it, it's, it's been gratifying. Of, you know, the, uh, under, under fire, it turns out that, that the stuff works, uh, but it also turns out that no one will listen. And so, um, uh, you know, people have, uh, actually, some, one of the things I'm surprised that didn't show up, a lot of people have been calling me the Cassandra of economics. And, they, and most of them think that they're insulting me. But what they forget is that Cassandra was always right. Thanks.